Yes, so now, yeah, good to go here. Okay, well, nice to see so many people here today. And uh, yeah, just want to welcome everyone to the June edition of the Global Diabetes Journal Club talk. And today we will talk about branch chain amino acids and the risk of developing type 2 diabetes. And this has been a, a highly debated topic because really do circulating branch chain amino acids cause type 2 diabetes? And what's the meaning of that? Could we then intervene on these branch chain amino acids to lower our risk of type 2 diabetes or, or what's up? Or is it just a simple consequence of some other metabolic aberration that causes type 2 diabetes? So that's basically the, that's some of the things we may touch on today. Uh, today's speaker, that's Jose Luis, and he will help us kind of get a good overview maybe of what's going on here. And Jose Luis is a PhD student from the University Medical Center of Groning in the Netherlands. And his research is, is focused on, I think, not just branch chain amino acids, but a lot of different biomarkers and risk prediction of type 2 diabetes and other cardiometabolic diseases. So yeah, so Luis, the, the floor is yours. And uh, yeah, look forward to hear what you have to say about the topic and your research. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Daniel. Uh, yeah, I, I really, I really appreciate the, the opportunity and the invitation to, to present some of, of my work and my thoughts about this, uh, well, this interesting uh, relationship in the context of, of diabetes. So I will start. Um, so yeah, of course, you say my name is Jose Luis. I'm, I'm PhD in the, in the Netherlands and I'm interested uh, not only on diabetes, but also hypertension and and chronic kidney disease. I am uh, very enthusiastic uh, in terms of, of patient analysis, although it's not, uh, you know, my, my, my skills are in, in Bayesian statistics are not very strong, but I'm, I'm very enthusiastic about that and also about context systems and yeah, several kind of biomarkers. So uh, about today, um, most of the topic, I think it will be about, about the background of this uh, relationship. And yeah, I will also share some of, of, my, of my results and how I have performed this analysis and the results and then let's see if we can uh, reach kind of conclusion. So um, first of all, uh, as, as you of course uh, know perfectly, there are more than 460 million people in the world with, uh, with diabetes. So indeed, if, if we put all these people together, uh, in form a country, it will be the, the third largest country in the world, so overpassing the United States. So there's a lot of people. And well, this is very important uh, disease in, in, in the elderly. So one in five people older than 60 years old has type 2 diabetes. And as you know, this, uh, the most prevalent form is type 2 diabetes. And more than 92% of people with diabetes has type 2 diabetes. This is a reference I learned uh, actually in the previous uh, in the previous journal club. So I invite everyone who missed the, the, the previous session to, to, to check it in the in the YouTube channel. It was a very nice presentation, and I learned I I just saw this paper from that, and I, I read with with a lot of interest. And yeah, it it it, it is like a bold critique about the the official statistics of of diabetes prevalence, I, I really enjoy the paper. And so one of these ideas is that, that the, the, basing the, uh, the, you know, the, the estimates only in glucose measurement can have a, an underestimation around 20 to 25% percent, percent of, of the total people with diabetes, which is like a, a very large number. And so having that in mind, uh, we are always looking for for more biomarkers that can allow us to, to identify people at higher risk of developing type 2 diabetes. And this is important because even though in some countries we are actually seeing uh, that, the, that the incidence of type 2 diabetes is, is, is not increasing, but actually stabilizing or even decreasing which in countries such as um, Sweden or, or Denmark, the prevalence of the disease because of the population keeps getting a, a longer life expectancy. We are expecting that the prevalence will keep increasing over the years. So yeah, we need more biomarkers. So 
So let's jump into the into the, into the amino acids, the branch chain amino acids. So this is a, the 20 amino acids that we know, and they can be classified according to the biological function, the structure, and so on. Or uh, one of more traditional classifications is if they are essential or not essential, meaning that uh, where can we get it? So if we can uh, produce these amino acids from other substrates in our body, in the human body, we call this non-essential amino acids, but for those amino acids that we can obtain as such only from food, we call this essential. And there are several essential amino acids, uh, the methionine, threonine, lysine, histidine, tryptophan, phenylalanine, and the valine, leucine, and isoleucine. And these three amino acids, valine, leucine, and isoleucine, they are so-called branch chain amino acids because they have like this is aliphatic component, it's this branch, which is not linear. And so these are the stars of this talk. The relationship or the potential relationship of amino of branch amino acids with uh, the metabolism of, of glucose, it is well known for, you know, even from the 60s or early. So this is one very vintage paper, general clinical investigation. And so yeah, the, the, these are not actually news. These are not, not news. It is something that it is uh, been known for for a long time. But I think this is one of the papers who actually uh, mark a, a before and later in terms of, of the relationship of branch amino acids with diabetes. It's a paper from from the group of uh, Robert Herzogten in Harvard. So it is. It has more than two point five. Thousand uh, citations, so it's a very popular paper, and it's interesting because it's it, it's a very simple study. So it's actually uh, conducted in around four hundred people, something like that, and it is very simple. You can check it, and you will easily understand it. And so, well, yeah, they although they say metabolic profiles, it is it can easily be named branch chain amino acids and type two diabetes because it's almost all about branch chain amino acids, and. But, and that was interesting because in the same study, they have also a, a replication cohort, which is very important. And we don't see that uh, quite often. So they replicate their studies in the, in the Malmo cohort from Sweden. So that's very interesting. These are the results from the, from the original cohort in the States. So you can see it's about 300 people. And you, you can see the, the association, or one standard deviation, and also they categorize the Branch chain amino acids they evaluated first uh, separately, but nowadays it is more common to to analyze them all together. And in any case, they were associated um, with the incidence of, of of type two diabetes. Importantly, after adjustment of plasma glucose, because it remains the main uh, one of the main predictors. And and th this is interesting, and maybe we can talk about that later because I was just thinking about that. that, that it is problematic when we are predicting diabetes because we need to make it independent of glucose. But actually, the definition of the outcome diabetes is actually a repeated measurement of, 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 the, of, the, of the predictor of glucose. It is a dichotomous version of the repeated measurement. So it's two times problematic in terms of statistics when you think about that. But we can talk about that later. And well, this is also in, from, from that paper. Yeah, so they explore this this set of of of, of metabolites, and of course, well, they, they are correlated with other amino acids. And uh, but here we can start speculating, even though they they made they didn't make it, because one of the strongest associations was actually with carnitine, which is biomarker from from meat and dairy uh, products. So that was interesting, but they didn't discuss it. So, uh, so after that, many papers have been uh, published about the association of branching amino acids and, and type 2 diabetes, um, both in basic science and in epidemiology. And yeah, I, I will only talk about uh, three, at least three aspects that are well, kind of well described in terms of, of how these this, this branching amino acids can be linked to type 2 diabetes. So it, it turns out that the branch amino acids uh, play a role 
in the metabolism in pancreas, muscle, and also in adipose tissue. So let's talk about pancreas because that's very important in the beta cells. Um, it is known that leucine is a potent and insulin secretagogue, and there are uh, called this one, a brief description of how this can be, be occurring in the beta cells. So after these uh, three steps, which is mediated by a uh, ketoisocarboyate, uh, it leads to, to the blockage of the, of the ATP, ATP channels of, of potassium in the beta cells, which leads to a uh, depolarization and therefore insulin secretion. And oh, this is also a very nice uh, summary if you're interested on this. And yeah, it says, I find this kind of interesting, but it says branch amino acids might be a marker, rather a cause of insulin resistance. But then just right after, alternatively two mechanisms have emerged indicating that the causative links exist. So yeah, even in the same paper, where there is no a, a clear agreement. And, and this is also important because I, I want to talk with you that some people, and I have listened to uh, some claims that, that it says that risk prediction doesn't necessarily has to be uh, uh, related or, ma or match with, with causal relationship. And that is true. But uh, some other people say that if your predictor is actually in the causal path, that makes it that by marker and not a good predictor. And I don't think that that, that is the case, the case uh, at least in this, in this case for French amino acids. So, and yep, in, the, in the muscle, what is happening is that the branching amino acids metabolism leads to the production of this, uh, this metabolite, uh, three hydroxy butyrate, and this leads to fatty acid uh, uptake in the muscles, therefore uh, a lipid accumulation in the muscle, which leads uh, also to insulin resistance in the, in the skeletal muscle. Uh, also, the other, the, the other pathway is the overactivation of the of the mTOR uh, mTOR C1 pathway, which uh, which prevents the, the the coupling of the um, of the insulin receptor in the in the muscle in the skeletal muscle, which also leads to insulin secretion and when of course this also leads to uh, uh, increased demand of of of, of the beta cells, which leads to type two diabetes. So on the other hand, there is also a very important role uh, in the main chain amino acids in the adipose tissue. And I, I personally found this, this, this mechanism one of the most uh, promising. So the thing is that brain, the adipose tissue is capable to, to, to metabolize brain chain amino acids. And <clears throat> it has been found that this uh, this metabolism, this catabolism of branching amino acids is a, it's actually more important in, or, or it, it appears at a higher rate in the, in the brown adipose tissue uh, that also you know, play an important role in the, in the homeostasis energy. And um, they, they have been found that there is, a, as you know, that uh, the widening of the, of the adipose tissue leads to a decrease of the, of the beige and brown adipose tissue. Therefore, people argue that uh, the, the risk uh, between branching amino acids and uh, the, the association between branching amino acids and high risk of type 2 diabetes, it can be also due to the fact of that the, the whitening of the adipose tissue So it seems that there are several causes of, of, of this relationship, which can be about the, the whole energy metabolism, also the insulin resistance, and perhaps diet. Uh, also, there are also the uh, studies that have been give some uh, some evidence about the relationship between uh, these branch amino acids and type 2 diabetes mediated by appetite control and also by, by, by microbiota. 
and I'm just gonna provide this very uh, small uh, view about the, the diet and this study that I found interesting. So the, the branched amino acids were measured in actually in urine in this cohort in China in two visits in 1996 and 1999. So uh, they actually didn't provide like the, the measurement in units like micrograms or micromoles, but also but rather in, in parts per million. So they saw that uh, the people in the, in the, in the north of, the, of, of China high, have actually higher concentrations, present higher concentrations of range in amino acids. And the, this change was from uh, 1996 in 1996 and also in one part per million in 1999. And as you can see, like the, the p-value is, is extremely low. So it's, it's, it's unlikely that this is uh, due to a false discovery. And of course, as you, uh, well, maybe you know, but uh, in the North part of China is where there are the highest uh, prevalence of type two diabetes. So they report how you know, this, this association may be also uh, of related to, to type two diabetes. So uh, now I'm gonna show some, some results from, from, uh, from the work that I have performed in, in collaboration with my colleagues in, in the University of Groningen and uh, when we explore the association of branched amino acids and, and type two diabetes. So we have been studying this, this association uh, in two populations. One is in the, in the general population, but also in kidney transplant recipients. Therefore, uh, our aim was to investigate the association of the, of the sum of this value inducing and isoleucine, the total concentration of branching amino acids with incidence of type 2 diabetes. Uh, to, to analyze this association, we use data from the prevent cohort which started in 1997 and in, in a follow up ends in 2012. So in this cohort, we have um, 8,500 patients enrolled, uh, but we exclude, of course, those with missing values of branching amino, amino acids at baseline. Likewise, we exclude the patients that have prevalent type 2 diabetes at baseline. So we use uh, 6,244 patients for this study. Um, we, um, we we use uh, we have three time points to, to evaluate the incidence of type two diabetes, which were measured as or were, which were um, uh, classified uh, with a fasting plasma glucose higher than one hundred twenty six milligrams per deciliter. The branching amino acids were actually measured by by uh, nuclear magnetic resonance in, in the in the facilities of LabCorp in, in North Carolina in the states. And for the statistics, we evaluate the association uh, with cross section analysis using linear regression. In the prospective analysis, using cost proportional hazard models, we evaluated both as uh, the branching amino acids as continuous and as categorical variable. And we uh, test that the assumptions were not violated using the Martinger residual, the Schumpeter residual. And we also uh, evaluate how and um, if, if the inclusion of branching amino, amino acids to a predictive model actually improve, improve the reclassification of patients and all the analysis were performed in our language for statistical computing software. So after uh, 8.4 years of follow-up, we identified 301 cases of type 2 diabetes and we found that the mean plasma branching amino acids were 370 uh, picomoles per liter. So these are the characteristics of, of, of our patients uh, divided in quantiles of branch chain amino acids. As you can see, uh, people in the, in the highest quintile has a higher B BMI, higher blood pressure, and higher diastolic blood pressure. And, uh, the, and the presence of chronic kidney disease were not particularly higher in those with, with higher uh, highest concentrations of, of branch chain amino acids and well but, but importantly there was like a, a history of type 2 diabetes in the family uh, higher in the, in the highest quantile. Uh, other markers of uh, you know like 
uh, tobacco consumption, alcohol consumption were, well, you know, like rather uh, uh, lower in the, in the highest quantile. But of course, uh, use of lipids and anti-hypertensive drugs were higher in this in this uh, top quintile. Um, well, this just to show that also like the concentrations of total cholesterol were higher as well as as the triglycerides and the association was uh, inverse with the HDL. And likewise, uh, concentrations of glucose and insulin uh, were higher in, in, the, in the top quintile of, of ancient amino acids <clears throat> and, the, and the EGFR and they uh, were lower and uh, the albumin excretion rate was, was uh, higher in the top quintile. Of ancient amino acids. Um, well, therefore, in uh, in this in this cross section analysis, we found that the the branch amino acids were uh, strongly associated with with BMI, uh, as well as 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 with with uh, parental history of type two diabetes. Uh, also, the the association was was significant with with triglycerides and also with insulin. And, and with urinary albumin excretion. <clears throat> Afterwards, we evaluate the prospective uh, relationship of branch amino acids with incident of type 2 diabetes. And we use these five models, uh, adjusting for age and sex and family history of type 2 diabetes, because as you saw, there, there were uh, associated of baseline, as well as alcohol consumption. We adjusted, of course, for BMI and for glucose, insulin, and triglycerides. And finally, for uh, adjunct excretion rate. So, um, so plasma concentrations of branch amino acids at baseline were associated with increasing risk of type 2 diabetes in the unadjusted model, both as, as a continuous and as categorical variable. And the same was true after adjustment for age, sex, and uh, the history of type 2 diabetes and alcohol consumption, glucose, triglycerides, and also the, the renal function. <clears throat> so this is the kaplan meyer plot that, that depicts the association of uh, branch amino acids with type 2 diabetes by quintiles. As you saw, the top quintile, it is uh, strongly associated with with incidence of type 2 diabetes. And the net of reclassification index, it's, it is a metric that I think it's not um, very reliable and accurate, but that just gives a, an idea uh, of rather uh, whether this, this biomarker, in this case, mentioned amino acids, is, is useful or not. So we found that actually 15% of population were correctly reclassified from a low to higher risk category. The conclusion of this particular study was that high plasma concentrations of brain chain amino acids are associated with increased risk of type 2 diabetes in both men and women. And well, we, do, we didn't have data uh, about uh, dietary patterns in this cohort. So it is more well, hard to, to evaluate if these uh, dietary measurements can uh, affect this association. Uh, we also perform uh, similar analysis, but uh, in a different cohort in a post transplant uh, patients. So, as you know, type 2 diabetes remains as the, one of the uh, leading causes of kidney failure and therefore of kidney transplant. But importantly, uh, after transplantation, post transplant diabetes mellitus is also an, an uh, important outcome that has to be studied because it also uh, of course, reduces the life expectancy of, of patients. So this was uh, the, done in collaboration with other co-authors from the from the University Medical Center Groningen, and we use, of course, like a lower uh, sample size because there are not many people that have the opportunity to have a, a kidney transplantation. So we use data from 368 people, and they will follow up. Uh, about 5.3 years, but still, that this is a relatively short follow-up. If you if you say, uh, still we found that there was like a significant uh, association. So in this 
this histogram actually depicts the, the situation how the highest concentrations of benzene amino acids are, are associated with a higher risk of post transplant diabetic tinnitus. <clears throat> then, this other study, what we did is to evaluate uh, what was the role of the branching amino acids in the, in the association of non alcoholic fatty liver disease to uh, type 2 diabetes. For this study, we use a proxy of, of non alcoholic fatty liver disease, which is this fatty liver index. Although the, the formula is quite long, it actually just requires information of triglycerides, BMI, EET, weight circumference, and that's it. And then the slide is cut off of 60 years. So you get values from, from one to 100. And uh, so it, it has been shown that the people with, with a cutoff higher than 60, they're, they're more likely to have non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. So um, we evaluated the, the association of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease uh, using this proxy of fatty liver index higher than 60 with risk of type 2 diabetes in the same, exactly in the same cohort, in the polyvalent cohort. So of course the association is it, very, very strong after adjustment for several variables, such as age, sex, history of type 2 diabetes, smoking, alcohol, uh, renal function, antihypertensive and lipid lowering medication, uh, insulin resistance measured by HOMA, ER, and HOMA Vita. <clears throat> and well, we also uh, adjusted for, for branch and amino acids. But then uh, we perform a mediation analysis. So this is like a, a, a graphical depiction of, of how this mediation analysis works. So we have the, the predictor, which was the fatty liver index. And then we measured the association with incident type 2 diabetes. And in the mediation analysis, we went from fatty liver index to branch amino acids and then to incident type 2 diabetes. So the, the mitigation analysis shown that 19.6% uh, of this association was actually mediated by brain chain amino acids. And then we have uh, another, another, uh, another study that it was, uh, the outcome was different. It was about hypertension. Um, so we use uh, likewise, the branch and amino acids as a biomarker and hypertension as, as an outcome. So we were very lucky because this paper was accepted actually in, in December, uh, well, not in, in, the, in the last issue. It was, uh, uh, was considered like the highest impact paper in, in hypertension in, in 2019 population science. And we were very lucky because like for one month of difference, that it would be 2020, so COVID. So I think it will not be even accepted. But yeah, we we're very lucky. Uh, I, I, I didn't. Well, I invite you to, to have a look on, on this paper. Uh, I, I, I don't have any, any further uh, slides of, of this paper because well, this was uh, about type two diabetes. But I think this this uh, this other outcome because you know there, there is like an overlapping of hypertension and type two diabetes. So I think it's also interesting to, to check this. And yeah, I, I was not sure about, about the timing. So this is what I have. And I, I, I would be very happy to, to, to discuss with you and your questions and also your ideas on how can we uh, improve this, this research about uh, branch amino acids. Of course, uh, I'm very grateful with my supervisors in the University Medical Center of Groningen, and as well as with, with, with colleagues in, in lab for lab actually made possible this and uh, these studies by, by doing the measurements of, of the branching amino acids. And yes, I will be very happy to, to take any questions and to, to start the discussion. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, much Jose Luis. Very, very good presentation. And uh, yeah, a very, uh, a lot of really good background. And I like that you started with this journal of clinical invest paper from like long time ago, right? Showing brain chain amino acids and, and insulin secretion, right? That's kind of where we all started. So I think that's a most really nice historical perspective as well. Um, yeah, so we have a have some questions in the in the chat and also know that you're also welcome to 
yeah to join in and, and just ask the, the question as as you you'd like but um yeah i guess we can we can start with one of the questions some if she has some questions about diet and i guess we can we can start by asking about just kind of like where does that fit into all of this because what you're talking about here right that's circulating branch chain amino acids yeah. right and, and then we can also get amino acids from the diet but how does that all kind of relate to each other um yeah do you have any th- uh, ideas about that yeah it's, it's, uh, i think it's important well, to distinguish a little bit yes yes uh, yeah I, I i i completely agree and yeah i think <clears throat> that it is it is it is very um yeah it, 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 it is very complex and 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 we cannot say that that uh, how, how I actually do not trust it, trust that, that that much this this paper that shows this association because and uh, that's actually one of the things that, that actually interests me uh, to to go from from uh, you know like like genomics and, and genetics to to metabolomics because because the metabolites that we are measuring are, are like very dynamic so the, the nature is, is dynamic so it, it doesn't exactly reflect what uh, what comes from 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 metabolism and what comes from diet so i think it is it is very hard to to establish this just this this association between what is circulating and we and what we have so i think that i this is where the um where the discrepancy actually comes because some studies show that, that uh, people that, for instance, I have seen uh, in this population that uh, that has uh, more, uh, let's say, a plant-based diet, have even lower concentrations of range in amino acids, which is kind of uh, uh, yeah, that doesn't make sense, right? And but for instance, I I I, I can say this that. One of the problems with this is that uh, we also have to put it in, in into the context of the of the social determinants, because for instance, uh, in these studies uh, that I was showing you in, in, in China, uh, the dietary patterns are more associated, for instance, with social economical status, uh, inversely associated, for instance. We can see that uh, here, here in Europe, it is more common that, that people with with a higher education, higher income, and so on have a better diet, have a more plant-based diet, uh, which is the opposite. For instance, in, in other in other countries where people that that have lower consumption of meat, it is because they cannot afford meat, and therefore there is uh, also they because of the social determinants of disease there there are also uh, other um, deleterious metabolic uh, issues going on so i think it is it is uh, yeah it is, it is very very difficult and what it has been shown and it is more reliable it is for example this um uh, this kind of food challenge when you give people uh, like a, a certain meal, and you immediately measure and you say, oh, "Okay, this goes up." And and there you can you you have a more uh, reliable idea. And yeah, there are a couple of studies that have shown that you know, like like if you give like a, a burger or something like a, a meat or, or dairy or, or something, then your concentrations of French amino acid goes up. Goes up. So that this is kind of certain. So this is kind of true, but but of course uh, the, the body doesn't work in, in this very small uh, time frame. So what is going it, it is longer. But yeah, this, I think it is. One and, and I guess some of the problem. like you you mentioned some of the mechanisms or like proposed mechanisms. So why is this why is this elevated level of bra- circulating brain chain amino acids rather right? associated with with type two diabetes, and I also think there have been some some Mendelian randomization studies that actually found this causal link. And I guess 
what I think we can take out of these Mendelian randomization study that are, they investigate kind of genetic determinants of these elevated levels of uh, branch chain amino acids. So they reflect this long-term kind of sustained a little bit higher um, level of, of circulating levels, um, whether that exposure is, is, is kind of causally related to, to development of diabetes. And they, there are some studies that actually show that. And I guess to me, that points at least towards that there is some sort of, that it has some sort of like, like it's more like a metabolic consequence in some way than it would just be like, for instance, for, from, from, the, from the diet. But, um, but there are some, some, some questions here I can see about uh, meat and, and, and whole grains or fiber as well um, and weight gain and how all these things play into each other. And I guess we can just say that it's, it is really, really complex, right, with, with all these, uh, these things. Um, yes, but maybe we could, um, I don't know if, 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 if you have a, like one particular question about the diet, I think you can, you can ask it here and we can see if we can, yeah, uh, get it. I think you can, yeah, just unmute yourself and, and ask the question. Um, and then I think we can go on from maybe talking to some of the other aspects as well, because I think there's a lot of interesting here, but like, like we can have a, a question about diet if you, if you want more specifically, yes. I've looked a lot at branch chain amino acids for a long time. And so they're a problem child for people with type one diabetes also. And I put notes in the chat for everyone. It's because it, they were not studied appropriately in the past. So I am so grateful for his presentation because we have to push on science a bit on this topic. And I don't know exactly how to get science going where we need to go. Some of the branch chain amino acids trigger insulin, but they may not suppress glucagon. And that may be why, partly because people get weight gain and get type two diabetes. As we know, there's another confound and that's meat intake because meat tends to have more fat unless you're eating lean meats like a wild game, chicken, fish. So I just wanted to ask if anyone looked at it or if he came across it, because I haven't found it, where anyone looked at the branch chain amino acids in a high meat, like an Atkins diet, if he found anything on it. Thank you, Dr. Flores Guillermo for speaking with us. Thanks, thanks, Eve. Um, yeah, like uh, one of the, the well, very big limitations that, that we have is that in this, uh, in this big cohort, uh, the prevent cohort, that we don't have any dietary data. So that's a, a, a real pity and a real limitation. So I can actually, uh, yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm very you know, limited in that sense. And for instance, in the other cohort that I show in of the post-transplant uh, recipients, we, we do have data at baseline, uh, which means at the start of the, uh, of the transplantation. But I think that we actually didn't want to include those results because I think those results are only uh, extrapolable to population of post-transplant recipients because there are also going on a lot of things. So people who, who receive the, you know, a new kidney, it's like, you know, they want to do everything good and, and they of course have a diet that is not comparable at all with, with people, you know, with general population. So yeah, the, so in that sense, even though we have some, you know, dietary data on that, it's like, no, we cannot extrapolate that. I, I believe that we, we shouldn't. Um, but yeah, one of the things that I, I forgot to, to mention, and this is where, where things get complex, is that, um, for instance, even from this uh, very early paper from the 60s, um, they show that actually uh, uh, leucine it is a, a potent secretagogue, but under uh, normal glycemic or even, yeah, even normal glycemic, but once there is like a, an onset of hyperglycemia, 
it seems that this uh, this mechanism that it is promoting, you know, the excretion of of uh, or the release of insulin, it stopped working because otherwise it would be be, be good. It would be like 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 a, a glibenclamide or something, no? you know, like it it is it actually it is what it does. Uh, it promotes the depolarization of the beta cell, and then you have more insulin, and you say, okay, that's it. Uh, but it, it stopped working. So at certain rate of, of hypoglycemia, it stopped working. So, and of course, uh, when, when we eat, we, we don't eat, you know, like brain chain amino acids and so on. So we, we have high dietary patterns that goes further than just uh, a meal. So it is like the, the you know, the, the, the whole thing. So probably this is, uh, this uh, alterous effect this this associated in the context of of hyperglycemia. So you are uh, already eating something that that certainly leads you to to type two diabetes, and then this is the kind of making it worse. And then uh, and then uh, and of course once the once the type two diabetes is already onset, then it it uh, it just sustain this this circle. Yeah, and it's it's um, also as you mentioned, all with the social determinants and how also our diet is related to also these things, right? So it is really hard to 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 separate that. Maybe it's a high meat diet that that maybe it increases weight, but it's not only the meat; it's all the things that that goes along with it. So it's it's hard to p- pass out. And if we and saying that it's only meat, it's it's always hard because you also have to think about. It's it's meat instead of something else, typically, right? If we if we want to look at it independent of kind of energy, but but that's not always what we want. But just just a side note. Um, do anyone ever have uh, some other questions regarding the the studies or, or these? Otherwise, I have a, like a more like specific question. Oh, you have one, Lauren. Um, just on behalf of Mihai, so Mihai Kortasu, I think this might be your first time. If you wanted to uh, introduce yourself just by unmuting, or I can read it for you. Um, I understand you're a postdoc in Canada and you do a lot of research focused on this. If not, I can just read the question. So Mihai had said, have you detected any other amino acids that might correlate well to type two diabetes, BMI, et cetera, apart from the valine, leucine, or isoleucine, so different amino acids? As I understood, a sort of NMR, nuclear magnetic resonance metabolomics was done for the determination of the three BCAA. Can you talk more about that? Uh, yeah, well, th- this is um, these were not uh, on, on target metabolomics, so uh, we actually ask for the this uh, this branch amino acids. So at the moment, we don't have any um, or any other uh, amino acid available. And it, it also, what was important is that this uh, this. Uh, 3 hydroxy isobutylate. I was very interested because it seems that this this uh, particularly uh, molecule, which is a subproduct of the metabolism of branch amino acids, it, it also be in the causal link of lip uh, fat uh, accumulation in the in the muscle. So I was very interested in that biomarker, but it was not possible to measure because you know like this this resolution of the of the spectroscope was not enough or something. And yeah, we were not able to, to measure this. And at the moment, uh, yeah, we, we don't have, um, yeah, we don't have uh, other amino acids uh, yeah, to, to identify the association. Yeah, thanks for that. And I wanted to highlight another question right after that from uh, Dr. Clifton Bogardis or Bo. Uh, he's actually from my branch in Phoenix. Um, Bo, if you wanted to unmute and ask your question, or I could for you. Yeah, sure. sure so- I can do it. Um, yeah, I was just wondering how much uh, genetic work has been done on the you know the circulating levels of amino acids. Have there been GWASs done for levels of the branch chain amino acids? 
Yeah, well, I'm not very certain about that, but what uh, what I'm sure is that uh, there's like a very, very nice Indian randomization that uh, I have been wanted to add to the presentation over the last three days, and I don't know why I didn't. And, and on, on my last slide, I just realized that I didn't mention, which is you know very important. So this was this uh, Mendelian randomization uh, done in the UK that, uh, you know, the Mendelian randomization is one of the more uh, reliable uh, causal inference sources that, that, that we have, uh, tools. And yeah, the, the, this this study was conducted in 2014, I believe. And yeah, it, it shows that, it, that there is actual uh, there is an, an, an actual link uh, between this, uh, this con high concentration of rich amino acids leading to to insulin resistance. And um, yeah, I think that this is one of the most relevant pieces. And and I own you, and I will post it in the in the Twitter of the of the journal flow because I think this is very important. It, it, it's a scene that I didn't include in this presentation. Sorry about that. No, no, it's uh, but it is yeah, it is a really interesting study, right? And and I think particularly with something that is circulating and if we can find genetic predictors of that, it's a, it's, it's a good example of maybe figuring out these, especially this kind of problem with, with timing of some of the, some of the, the measures. Um, and, and one of the things I was wondering about as well was you, when you talked about this uh, fatty liver index, uh, I wasn't sure if it was measured at the same time as the biomarkers, like the measures that kind of went into this, formula to calculate this fatty liver index what they measured at the same time as the as the kind of biomarkers right and then you looked um yes. kind of at, at some sort of mediation there yes 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 but what we will measure at baseline what, what, because uh, as you saw that there are like kind of common uh, biomarkers like uh, glucose and triglycerides and and, and ggd and yeah so yeah they, they were all they were measured at the baseline. We actually, we actually perform a sensitivity analysis using another. What this was, this was the fatty liver index, but this is like a hepatocytosis index, something like that, which, which is also a proxy that uses a different uh, liver enzymes. And yeah, and, and well, yeah, this, the results were, were pretty much uh, similar, so they were congruent. But yeah, they, all, all of them were measured at baseline. Yeah, sometimes it's just hard to actually know exactly kind of when things things happen, right? But that's that's sometimes we just have the, the data that we, that we have. And I also thought it was interesting, like you mentioned this link with hypertension. And I also think there are studies that show that kind of branch chain amino acids like circulating levels are also related to cardiovascular disease as well. So there seems to be some sort of shared um, kind of, I don't know if it's a, like metabolic defect or like what we should should call it but there's at least something going on right that that elevates your risk of actually not just diabetes but like several um, cardiometabolic diseases yeah yeah uh, well it, it is um there are, there are several studies that have shown that that uh, the insulin resistance led by itself to um to endothelial dysfunction so irrespectively of you know the whole diabetes and weight and so on, so just by itself, by, by itself in the in the epithelium, it leads to to um, to this uh, endothelial dysfunction and this hyper uh, reactivity, which leads to more vasoconstriction and less uh, and vasodilatation. And yeah, uh, also in one of the slides, I, I show that that uh, these branch amino acids have also been linked. To, um, to oxidative stress, because it seems that it, it also uh, have an, an effect in, in mitochondrial metabolism. So whether or not this happens in situ in the in the endothelium, it is, uh, as far as I know, it is unknown. And but yeah, that would be very very interesting to do some some um, some vascular reactivity assays. Just you know, you just have like the the, the rings of the arteria and you can incubate it with with uh, revenge amino acids and yeah that will be very interesting to see what what happens but uh, as far as I know it, it, it hasn't happened but yeah mm. perhaps yeah thank you. yeah it's 
It's very interesting. Any, uh, Camille, do you have a question? Yeah, I do have a question. So thank you for this presentation. I really joined very late, so what's the end? So I have a very broad question because I'm coming from a very naive point of view. And so my question is really maybe about the implication of these findings. So again, I didn't follow the background, but then I'm wondering, so what are these branching amino acids? Are they more of markers of lifestyle of dietary intake or something, or are there metabolic consequences or metabolic changes that precede the disease? For example, you talked about the paper you published, which is a mark of hypertension and then uh, associated with incident diabetes. So I'm just wondering, is it more of telling us about the exposure or is it just preceding these disease outcomes? Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> Uh, well, I, I, I think it, it is, uh, well, it seems that it is a good biomarker. We, we actually um, include these, these branch amino acids in, in another polybiomarker that it's called the uh, diabetes, uh, diabetes risk index, which uses branch amino acids in lipoprotein subparticles. And yeah, it has a, a very, very, uh, strong predictive power and you know it, it doesn't have like that much overfitting and it's well calibrated and so on so that, that's a very good uh, polybiomarker that includes branch amino acids so i believe that it is um well i consider that it is that besides being, <laughs> being a, a good marker uh, based on, on what we uh, what we saw today uh, it seems that it is linked and for me, and based on, on, on the evidence that we, we have seen, uh, I think that more, probably the more uh, strong association goes uh, via the, uh, the, the lipid, the lipid, uh, the lipid and, and how it is like in a, a I, I can't even show you what this. It will take some time, but yeah, it seems that, that the brown adipose tissue catabolizes the brain chain amino acids uh, at faster rate than the white adipose tissue. So when we lose this uh, balance between brown adipose tissue and white adipose tissue, we have less brown adipose tissue, then we have, a, we look kind of lose this capacity to metabolize these brain chain amino acids. And therefore you will have more uh, brain chain amino acids in the circulation. So that is uh, for me uh, a very, um, yeah, like a very uh, a strong uh, link. It's almost there. Yeah. Oh. I, I can even see what I'm showing, uh, but yeah. Uh, I think what, this is one of, of, of very uh, reliable uh, information in relation to to this to this link, and also there is there was uh, another study that shows that um, uh, well a, a diet a dietary reduction in in range and amino acids actually uh, improve and it is associated with um, with loss weight and, and so on. But I think that that is expected because. Uh, branch amino acids are a more, well, meat and dietary and diet, very foods has more uh, concentrations of branch amino acids. And those are classically associated to overweight and you know, to gain weight. So uh, it is more common that, you know, diet that leads to, uh, to lose weight. Well, for me, it is kind of expected to, to have a, a lower concentration of branch amino acids. Yeah, so it's hard to separate these 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 things like exactly yeah. if you did a like complete like food based dietary intervention, otherwise we'll have to do some like supplementation thing. But I, I haven't seen studies studies on that. But maybe maybe they're out there. But I think this is a good um, a good kind of landing landing spot right for 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 the discussion today. So there definitely seems to be something, whether or not we are entirely sure. If it's this by themselves that they are causing 
diabetes or, or other cardiometabolic uh, health issues, it's, it's, it's more uncertain. And there definitely seems to be more to kind of discover about what's, what's, going, what's going on behind the scenes, if we can say it like, like that. Uh, so thank you very much, uh, Jose Luis, for a very nice presentation and a lot of good discussion and some, some yeah, you provided some really good answers for, for, the, for the questions. So just before we kind of finish up here, I'll just like to say, or just to mention that, that thank you for all you for joining here, the Global Diabetes Journal Club talks. And we've been going on with these talks for about actually two years now, I think, almost. So it's... Uh, it's been, a, it's been a good journey, and I just wanted to say that we also have other speakers coming up uh, the rest of the, the, the year. So just uh, yeah, keep following the, the, the Twitter, Twitter handle, and we will let you know about the upcoming speakers. It's, of course, it's about diabetes, but then there's a lot of different interesting topics as, as today. And I also mentioned that we are working on building like a, a website, so... So kind of early, particularly for early career researchers to kind of connect and, and share their work within diabetes research and also for, for other people to follow along some of these, like uh, what, what the research is, is saying and what's going on. So yeah, so I think that's uh, it. I'll just like to say, uh, yeah, thank you here and I'll just stop recording.